At least households are in good shape, says this guy, Calafia Beach Pundit. I have no clue where Calafia Beach is, but man alive, look at that. Is that Spain or something like that? Because if so, count me in. Uh, so let's read this guy. So again, I get Nick Murray Interactive, uh, Nick Murray, uh, nickmurray.com. I can't remember, but Nick Murray is the, uh, the guy I read religiously. have been reading him for a long time. He's had a huge impact on my life. Never met the guy. I've seen him speak twice live. Um, but uh, anyway, you should read him too. And he has this thing called Resources Page. Uh, and it's just, this guy just scours uh, for information that's out there. And uh, and I read it and I enjoy it and I forward it to you guys. So let's read what, uh, I have no clue who, Calif- Califia, Califia? I don't know. In Maine we'd say Califia. I'm sure it's probably pronounced Califia. Because I used to also say Savannah was Savannah. Yeah. All right. So let's see what we're talking about here. Actually, who writes this stuff? This guy's named Scott something. Uh, we'll go into about him. Uh, this guy right here. Uh, so we'll read this first, and we'll read this uh, happy guy with his uh, pretty wife. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy with a pretty life living wherever that place is, too. Man, life is good. The world is, uh, Dateline, June 21st, 2019. The world is fixated on tariffs, weakened economies, China, central bank policies, low interest rates, high equity prices, and the possibility of a looming recession. Ah! Now we're fixated on gun deaths, which is silly, but we'll talk about that for a different thing here real quick. It's not silly for the people who are involved in the inner cities. It's silly for you in suburbia to be worried about gun deaths. It really is. But the folks who can't escape the inner cities because of our insane uh, prohibition, which leads to gangsters, um, I, I need nothing but empathy. Nothing but empathy. Is it empathy or sympathy? I can't remember, but it just breaks my heart. Um, breaks my heart. Lots of things to worry about, and no one can confidently predict the future at this point. Well, no one can confidently predict the future at all. He didn't mention the worry about the climate change either. Uh, <laughs> you know, Greenland uh, will so, will quickly uh, be half of its ice uh, sheets will be gone. Uh, the way it's melting currently at 100 billion tons a year, half its ice sheets will be gone in 25,000 years. We need to really be worried about that. Too many variables, some of which are political. So I thought I'd briefly change the subject, subject and talk about the financial health of the household sector of the U.S. economy which is a, actually quite good. So, I, man, I love this chart. So here's U.S. households financial burdens, debt, essentially. Total financial obligations. Uh, this is payments, percent of disposable income. All right, so we got, and what is this from? Federal Reserve. I wonder if they got the disposable income correct. I don't know. But let's, uh, so going back to 1980, uh, the last part of Jimmy Carter, we had 15% of disposable income was going to service debt. Fast forward to, 2019 and just a little bit above 15 percent of our income disposal income is going to service debt and uh right before the great recession we had what's that 18 percent of our income was going to service debt and then uh in 19 2001 a little bit less than 18 percent so you can see we are actually well low below uh the last what's that 40 years essentially which is pretty cool man uh, chart one shows households' financial burdens, which are defined as, mo- as monthly debt service payments as percent of disposable income. This is a robust measure of debt payments since it compares a flow, debt payments, to a flow income, right? cash flow. Uh, by this measure, household debts are historically low levels, and I've been for a number of years. Uh, no sign of excessive borrowing as there was in the past three recessions. So here are the past three recessions. Uh, yeah, that's in hindsight, it always looks excessive. You did not know that at that point. But anyway, either way, we're certainly not there relative to what's been the last 40 years, other than Jimmy Carter's thing. Of course, that was because we had mass inflation anyway. Of course, that would have been the time to borrow, by the way. But okay. Uh, household leverage. Uh, chart two compares a stock liabilities to a stock assets. Uh, I'd say it's a, a balance sheet, actually. Liability to assets. And here, uh, going back to 1952, we are below the lowest has been since 1982. Look at that. That's freaking nuts, dude. That I, Since 1982. And this measure of household leverage is as low as has been since the mid-80s. Compares us liability to assets. Look at that. So we have assets of, I don't know, freaking 100. And we have liabilities of, what, 12 and a half? That's, and yet in 2000, and I guess that's got to be 2008, 
we had li we had assets of 100 and liabilities of 20. So 20% 20 debt to equity ratio is kind of what it would be. It still seems pretty low to me, but anyway, either way, look at that. We, I mean, we're lower than we've been at any time since 1982. Now we're much higher than we've been at any time, you know, from the last, I mean, so basically you can divide this into two phrases, phases from 50 to 80, from 80 till now. And now we're still significantly higher than what we were the previous three generations. But I mean, I'll take this generation any day of the week over that simply because look at our modern amenities. It's fantastic. I know, that's crazy. All right. Household net worth chart number three has reached another all time high, $109 trillion. That's nuts. Remember, net worth is assets minus liabilities. So here you go, 109 million in total net worth, financial assets. Uh, let's see, real, oh, I can't, that's a, that's a tough, that's the debt too. So that's total net worth, which takes out debt. Uh, this has been achieved primarily by increased savings and investments in both stocks and bonds. Home price appreciation has played only a minor role since the value of households, real estate holdings has appreciated less than 20% since the housing peak of 2006. At the same time, total debt has increased by only 2007. So think about that. Our real, this is just real estate. Since 2006, I mean, this is the beginning of the market chaos. Real estate has appreciated 20%, but our total debt has only increased by 10. So that's a, a doubling of just net worth right there. But then you throw uh, financial assets and it's, uh, it looks like financial assets dwarf real estate assets. That's, uh, that's interesting. So balance sheets are 109 trillion and that includes debt. And here's a debt level. Look at that. Just right there, just flat, not much. All right, let's keep going. Uh, the inflation adjusted value of household net worth. So we're adjusting with inflation in 3.6 PA trend. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, per year, uh, it's important. Okay, so inflation net, uh, household net worth adjusted for inflation has also reached an all time high. It's important to note that this measure by financial wealth being has been increasing by about 3.6% a year for many decades. Recent gains are almost exactly in line with historical experience. Nothing unusual, unsustainable about that. Man, look at that. Look at that trend line. And, you know, right before the trend line of the 2001 or 2000 crisis, the 2007 crisis is under the trend line. Now we're back up just literally right on the trend line, 3.6 a year. Real household net worth adjusted for inflation, trillions of dollars. That's uh. Uh, that's fantastic. U.S. real per capita net worth, not capital capita per head. Um, we're a little bit above the trend line, but not, you know, but in the 80s and 70s were significantly below, below the trend line. The 50s were below the trend line. In the last 20 years, we've been above the trend line, except for a little bit there in, uh, from 2009 to probably 2012. Uh, inflation adjusted per capita Level of net worth, which is also at an all-time high, hit 200, 329,000 per person. Again, that's adjusted for inflation. Note that this too has been growing at close to its long-term trend rate, about 2.3%. That growth rate is only slightly higher than the 2% annual increase in labor productivity since 1950, which makes sense. Living standards can only rise if we work harder and more efficiently, and that in turn requires investments of time and money, i.e. capital. Uh, federal debt owed to the public, currently in 16.2 trillion, has been soaring by virtually any measure. All right, federal debt owed to the public. What's this? Debt is as a percentage of GDP. Okay, there we go. As a percent of GDP, federal debt is approaching 80 percent of GDP. That's the amount of debt we owe to the GDP, gross domestic product, but we owe. 16.2 trillion. I thought our, our, our GDP is a five trillion. Okay, I guess I was wrong. It's worth, okay, that's the highest level since the early 50s, but look at this, since the early 50s. So the debt level was high back then, and yet, look, if we go back here, we're sitting there like, look at the 50s when we had uh, household leverage was low, but the government debt was quite high. Of course, we're knocking it down because the war was over. That's, man, that's just interesting to me. It's worth noting that contrary to what to my, many might think, rising debt burdens do not necessarily translate into higher interest rates. Well, yeah, no kidding. I mean, look, rising debt, interest rates go down. Ex exactly. Uh, bond yields high while the interest, while the debt was going down. And so take your stupid economics textbook and just literally set it on fire. 
It's kind of like the Phillips curve. High unemployment, high employment leads to high inflation. It's just, uh, just these economists are just driving me insane. So there we go. Bond yields high. Debt was that the lowest has been. Bond yields low. The lowest has been. Debt is at a sec, basically the second highest has been. If anything, there appears to be an inverse correlation between debt burdens and interest rates, which is nuts. Federal debt as percent of household net worth. So back in the 2001, the federal debt was roughly 7.5% of household net worth. And then in 2019, it's about, four, it's about double. All right. When compared to household net worth, federal debt has actually been declining for the past six to seven years. Yeah, I guess so, not by much. But I mean, 16% the, the, the when Obama was shooting for re-election, dropped, went up a little bit, dropped. So, I mean, it's still pretty high. No other way around that. But with federal debt level as a percentage of household net worth, we've got $109 trillion in net worth. And our federal debt is, let's just say, $20 trillion. I mean, that's, I mean, look, that's all. You can't write a check for that, but it's interesting. Uh, but it's not beyond the range. The current level, 15%, is high, but it's not beyond the range of the believable. If you all wrote a check to the government for 15% of our net worth, our painful thought, but not a killer, federal debt would disappear. Actually, I just want to go over this one right here. Um, GDP, uh, which is the one I wanted to go to? Yeah, right here. So debt, percentage of GDP. So right now, Japan has got 190% debt as a percent of GDP, and we're at 80%. And remember, everyone thinks we're, inflation has to come. We, inflationary inherently has to come. Well, Japan's got, what, two and a half times our debt level, and they're not inflation. So anyway, there we go. I mean, so even though our debt levels are jumping up relative to what his, you know, the last 40 years were, that does not necessarily mean it's inflationary. It just doesn't. I mean, because we can look at Japan to show that. Their debt level is, is two and a half times ours. See what some of the comments say. Uh, your last chart is revealing and perhaps largely a reason why despite the what appears to be a dangerous escalation of federal debt, the yield in the 10-year continues to defy expectations. One would think the federal debt would be per pernicious that interest rates would soar. Yeah, I, man, I completely agree with that. If the federal debt was out of control, the interest rates were sure. Yep. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a financial nihilist, I'm beginning to wonder why it's federal debt and if it matters. What is federal debt and if it matters? I agree with that. The FC, Federal Reserve Board and the Bank of Japan. Yeah, look at that. And the ECB, European, uh, European Central Bank, appear to be able to buy back federal debt without inflationary consequence. There are trillions of dollars of sovereign bonds outstanding to offer negative interest rates, indeed a growing pool. We'll see if the U.S. joins Japan and Europe and becomes a sovereign issue that issues bonds at zero. They're not going to do that. And maybe that monetary authorities will lose ability to stimulate or contract economies, at least with conventional tools. Interesting. Uh, this guy says, sir, you always blow me away with solid facts, but I'm about to fall prey to the fake news syndrome. My only concern with these household debt net worth statistics is that I worry about that we have this buy model distribution. We have many Americans with nearly no assets and credit card, and then we have wealthier people with plenty of assets. No, I agree with that. I, I think that could be a concern, absolutely, without question. I completely agree. But the people with no assets also get more transfer, uh, transfer income. And transfer income is not reflected in uh, uh, as a percentage of disposable income. Let's see. Is this a, yeah, is a, dis a transfer income, i.e. welfare payments, are not seen. In, I'm not even, Social Security is not welfare. I'm not sure if Social Security is reflected in there. But transfer payments are not seen as a percentage of uh, disposable income. They're not. So the people on the bottom, even though they might not have the earned income, 1099 or W-2 income, they, they have other income from Medicaid, welfare payments, food stamps, SNAP, and that kind of stuff. So that's, but that's, I think that's a good point, though. Um, so much seems to be riding on the financial asset appreciation, namely the stock market. I wonder how, many, how some of the charts above may change if there's a crash. Um, let's take a look. So right now the markets are getting killed. Dow's down 760 because of China. And of course, Bloomberg is now saying the yield curve blares loudest. Recession warning since 2007. Oh, no. It was interesting. All right, so let's see. Scott, the guy who writes this, says, is depreciation of financial assets ephemeral? Ephemeral? I don't know what that is. The bedrock of equity price appreciation is corporate profits, which have been historically high levels, both nominally and relative to GDP. Throughout most of the past decade, even, equity prices are vulnerable should corporate profits decline, but presumably 
that will only occur if there's some shock to the economy, recession caused by tight, overly tight monetary policy. Exactly, which is why Trump is arguing against that. Uh, an increase in corporate tax rates, natural disaster, or war. If after-tax profits remain at current levels relative to GDP, then there's every reason to believe the stock market will not suffer debilitating crash. In other words, stock prices are not at bubble risk of, of bursting just because. I could not agree with that more. All right, so let's, uh, let's who is this guy, Scott? So let's take a look. So, man, look at this guy's been, he had, this guy's been posting a lot, man. Going back to 2008. Look at that. That's nuts. I've never seen this guy, but I'll be following him. That's for sure. Let's see what uh, who this guy is. So there he is. Chief economist at Western Asset Management. There you go. Western Asset Management. One of the best bond shops in the world. Um, in fact, that was part of Leg Mason. Owned Western Asset Management. And they had some good bonds for sure. Okay. Uh, I now enjoy keeping up on economics, markets, and politics from my condo overlooking Califia Beach on Southern California coast. But I'd like to think I'm immune to Wall Street groupthink. Married 45, 43 years to my wonderful Argentine wife, Norma. We have four children and five grandchildren. I'm a believer in supply-side economic theory as practiced by my mentors, Jude Winiski, Art Laffer, and Larry Kudlow. John Rutledge is another one of my mentors from the days we worked together at Claremont Economics Institute. All right, there you go, man. All right, so he's a, my kind of guy. How do you follow this guy? I'm not sure how to do it, but... Uh, Right on, man. Big fan. Big fan. So definitely follow old Scott here. That's good stuff. So, all right. Punch or some, I should, yeah. Punch. Punch with a left hook. Punch. A left jab. Punch the smash button, the like button. Subscribe, share. We'll see.